Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens me. What a great way to start worship this morning. Thank you for being at New Hope Community Church today. It's great to have you here on this August summer Sunday morning. It actually felt a little cool out early this morning, all right? I kind of liked it. I don't know that it's going to stay that way all day, but it was a great way to start it, and this is a great way for you to start, for us to start our Sunday morning. Thanks for being here. If this is your first time here, uh, we had a guy in 8 o'clock service, first time. We don't usually get first timers at 8 o'clock, all right? They work up to that service, okay? Uh, but first time here, it was absolutely terrific. Nice to meet John. Uh, but if this is your first time here, there's a communication card in the pew in front of you. I would love for you to fill it out. Drop it in the offering bag uh, next week through the mail. We're going to send you information about the church that we hope will answer most of your questions. We promise we are not going to beat on your door. You're not going to have somebody call you on the phone unless you ask for it. Uh, and, and we're not going to sell your address to Google, all right? Uh, we just want to get information that answers a lot of questions about New Hope Church what we believe in our staff and the ministry opportunities and services that are available. So uh, please fill that out. Those cards are also for our church family for uh, prayer requests, praise items, messages, communications to our staff. Uh, we assimilate all that stuff first bright and early on Tuesday morning. So we'd love to hear from you. Uh, let me highlight several announcements and then updates on some prayer requests and we'll get engaged in our worship today. Um, ladies, if uh, you have not purchased your ticket for movie day, which is coming up this coming Saturday, August the 26th, you may see Fawn Boss. Fawn, stand up. All right, stand up. And you can see her after the service, and she will sell you that $1 ticket. I saw you getting some before service started. Uh, the guys still have a table outside, all right? Uh, they, sold, they sold 91 tickets last Sunday, having the sausages out there, the barbecue sausage, man. Uh, that was a big hit. So, ladies, thank you for motivating the men to get aggressive with, uh, uh, with selling those tickets. And what the men are selling tickets for is a tri-tip dinner that will be ready for you at the end of your movie, all right? So, ladies, you can buy the tickets and take dinner home to your husband so you don't have to cook. Or men, you can buy tickets and meet your wives down here and pick up your dinner. You can eat them here. You can take them to the park or you can take them home. Uh, here's the thing that I don't think we've emphasized this uh, publicly, except maybe in the bulletin, but I haven't said it out loud. You can't just show up and buy your dinner. Okay, you got to get your ticket in advance so that they have enough. If you just show up, you're running the risk if they're going to have leftovers. All right, if they don't have enough because they're going to have enough for all the tickets, and if somebody doesn't show, you might get one. So you need to get them in advance, $10. It's a great dinner, and uh, it's a fundraiser for, uh, for the men, okay? Uh, there's also that rib and chili cook-off that day. If you have questions about it, uh, talk to Mark out there under the pavilion. Uh, my understanding is you don't have to do anything advanced except bring your ribs or chili. And you don't have to bring both. If you just do chili, great. You just do ribs, great. You do both, that's great. And uh, there'll be judges judging your chili and your ribs that day. Um, Widow's Lunch Bunch is kind of tagging on to this whole event day. And so um, they're going to be getting their meal, all right, from the guys when the movie is over, and then they're going to Sally Wan's house together uh, for an evening. So if you want to be part of that, please contact Sally Wan, all right, and she'll get you all that information. Next Sunday afternoon, we're going to ask you to do something we know is hard to do. That is, after you leave the 915 service, we want you to go have a fine breakfast or early lunch, and then come back about 1215 for about a half-hour business session, all right? It's important for our entire church to have as many of you here as possible. Uh, we've got a few things we need to, 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 to do. Uh, one of those is we have seven deacons, uh, and, 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 and men and women, that we want to recommend to you for your approval. They've already met. <laughs> They're, they are faith-based people. They're believing you're going to approve them, all right? So they've already met this past week so that once they're approved, they hit the ground running, and we're excited about that. Um, second of all, we're going to bring you up to date on uh, our remodel project. We're basically, we, we have one thing left to do, and that is some uh, lighting improvements for the stage up here. Everything else has been done. I don't know if you all noticed the new handicap access on my left facing that way or coming in. This is out front. You have a choice now of coming up either in front of the fountain or uh, just on the south side of the church right over here. I know some of you were hoping there would be one right in the middle. Uh, that would have been way, way against the ADA codes. 
Okay, we would have violated about everything there if we had to put it right in the middle. Uh, because of the posts where they are, because of the uh, slope already that's on there, it would have required taking off the entire front end of the church and redoing, and redoing that in order to put one right smack dab in the middle. So people in the parking lot will have the choice coming up either in front of the fountain or over here on the left side. And so that got finished this week. So we'll bring you up to date where we are in costs and all of that. And we have a presentation about remodeling the last set of bathrooms in the other building to share with you and seek your approval on. Uh, so anyway, those are a few of the things that we're going to cover. Oh, and we're also going to talk about the next step. The next step. Uh, what are we going to do about building a reception facility and office? So once we finish this, our next step is to look at that. And so we're going to tentatively talk about that this next Sunday afternoon. All right. Uh, a few other things happening. Grief Share is going to kick off August 29th and 30th. Uh, so put those dates down if you would like to be a part of that Bible study and support group. Financial Peace is going to start at 4 o'clock on Sunday, September the 17th. That is a nine-week study on finances. It will go from 4 to 5.30. If you had signed up for the uh, football game and tailgating, that got canceled. <laughs> Let me tell you what happened. Uh, on Tuesday before last Sunday, Mark had called. They said, no problem. When you get your number, call us on Monday. We'll have your tickets for you. On Wednesday, they announced they were going to retire Derek Carr jersey, and Derek Carr would be present at the football game. They sold out in 48 hours. So before we passed the sign-up sheet around last Sunday, they had already sold out. And so when we called Monday to place the order, it was too late. And so uh, we are very, very sorry about that. They're going to see if there is another one that will get rescheduled uh, later in the year. Probably after they get whipped badly by Alabama, attendance will drop just a bit, and we'll be able to get into one. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm just saying. Um, it, 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 I, I did say it. I mean, I'm a, I'm a Bulldog fan, I just, but I just sort of know what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't have yet faith about them beating Alabama, all right? Um, I hope you take the opportunity to read our volunteer recognition that is in there. Nan Isom is in this service. Nan, stand up real quick. Let's recognize you two ways. Nan, stand up. She has been teaching uh, Tuesday night women's Bible study for years and years and years. And many may not know this, but also Nan was uh, part of the original two that founded our Grief Share Bible study here at New Hope. How many years ago was that, Nan? 20? Yeah, I think it's right at 20 years ago. And so please take the opportunity to read about our volunteers and their service to our church that's in your bulletin. I was handed a whole lot of things today in 8 o'clock service. Let me see if I can get through those. Uh, there are some... Uh, uh, little sheets of paper like this in the back of the foyer about Pregnancy Care Center. They have need for volunteers in a variety of ways, and it tells you what they're looking for, and there's an orientation coming up September the 7th. So if that has some interest for you, please take advantage of that. Um, our Thursday morning men's Bible study is going to be starting a new study the Thursday after Labor Day. It's going to be a year-long study. We normally do ones that are just six weeks, eight weeks, ten weeks. We're going deep. I don't want to scare you, man, but it will be a great time to come in. Join. It's, it's 6 to 6.45, um, and we're going we're gonna to look at a term. Here it is. It's called apologetics. Does that terrify you? It terrifies most of us. It's, it's a doctrinal study, but here's what apologetics is. It's slightly different than just a doctrinal study. It is, it's, it's learning what you believe and why you believe it in such a way that you can talk to others about it. That's what apologetics really is. It's, it's, it's not going out and getting in people's face, but it's when somebody asks you for the reason of the hope that you have, it's knowing why you have the hope and being able to talk about the hope in a way that would be engaging to them. And so uh, we, because we only meet for 45 minutes and 30 minutes of that is our Bible study time, it's going to take us a while to get through it. And so, uh, but we're looking forward to that. So come check us out. Between now and that Thursday, uh, we're having testimonies from other guys in our group and we're answering questions that uh, some of the men have been asking over the past several months. So would love to have you uh, get engaged with that. Let me see here. One last announcement and everything else is a prayer request. Um, I just heard about this this morning. Steve McQueen, an American icon. How many of you know who Steve McQueen is? You two have no idea who Steve McQueen is, do you? <laughs> Who's the star in Jason Bourne? 
Who? Matt Damon. Do you know who Matt Damon is? Okay. Steve McQueen was our Matt Damon. Okay? He played those kind of roles. Okay? Um, and, and, and he's in heaven now. But he was not a nice guy most of his life. I've told a story about Steve McQueen coming to Christ here several times when I said that in the 8 o'clock service. How many of you remember that story? Raise your hand. Obviously, most of you were sleeping when I've told that story other times, which was here. Um, short version of that story. Um, uh, Steve McQueen went one night to a Billy Graham crusade in L.A. He was moved, but he had questions. So he reached out to see if by any chance Billy Graham could meet with him. Well, he couldn't that night, but he said, I'll be flying back through Los Angeles, and I've got a long layover. If you could meet me, I would be happy to talk with you and see if I can answer your questions. What the questions that he had were, he didn't believe that God could forgive a guy who'd done so many horrible things as Steve McQueen believed that he had done. And so as Graham was flying through L.A., Steve McQueen showed up in his limousine and Billy Graham came out and took a seat in the, in, in the limousine and visited with Steve McQueen. Billy Graham went over verse after verse about God's love and God's forgiveness and McQueen was still struggling with it. He finally took him to Titus chapter 1 verse 2. And I can't quote that entire verse off the top of my head. Usually I tell this story with notes in front of me. Um, but Titus chapter 1 verse 2 says something like this. For the God who cannot lie forgives us of our sins. And, oh, there it is. A faith and a knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. And for some reason, that verse clicked in Steve McQueen's head. A God who does not lie promised from the beginning faith and knowledge and the hope of eternal life. And Steve McQueen prayed to receive Jesus Christ in his limo. And then he asked Billy Graham if he could borrow his pen. And Billy said, what do you want to borrow a pen for? And he said, I want to write that verse down so I don't forget it. And Billy said, you can't have my pen. And Billy Graham took the pen out of his coat pocket and he opened up his Bible and he turned to Titus 1-2 and he circled it and he highlighted it and he put the ribbon in it and he said, you can't have my pen, but you can have my Bible. And he gave to Steve McQueen his Bible. Just a few months later, Steve McQueen was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Steve McQueen did all the treatment that they had available for him here in the States. It was not successful. So he decided, what do I have to lose? And he went to Mexico for an experimental treatment. And while he was in the facility in Mexico, he was struggling. And one night he asked the nurse, could you bring me my Bible? The one Graham had given to him. And she gave him the Bible and she walked out. When she came back to check on him about an hour later, Steve McQueen had died. The Bible was on his chest, opened, and his finger was resting on Titus chapter 1, verse 2. The God who cannot lie has given us hope of everlasting life. Greg Lowry's organization has done a movie called The Salvation of Steve McQueen, an American Icon. It will be shown in Fresno one night and one night only, September the 28th at Edwards Theater at 7 p.m., if you would like to get a ticket, you have to go online to get it. Uh, I'm assuming you can either go to Edwards Theater or Google uh, Salvation of Steve McQueen, American Icon, uh, and you'll find out how to buy them. But you have to get your tickets online. Uh, so I'm, I'm passing that on because I think it would be great for as many of you to see as possible. All right, prayer requests. Um, Wanda and Fern from our 8 o'clock service, uh, their daughter and granddaughter Brandy, who had the the, the tumor and cancer in her eye, uh, was not expected to live more than just a few months, went to Boston, had a lot of treatment. She's done well for about a year. They need to do something now. The tumor is back. And so there's going to be surgery on the 24th of this month. She is going to lose her vision with this surgery, but hopefully they can abate the cancer. So please be praying for Brandy. Randy Covey just had double lung transplant in Stanford. He is an ICU there. He is a friend of one of our 8 o'clock uh, regular attenders. Um, we had two praise items in our 8 o'clock service. Sherry Waxel, who had a uh, knot on her lung, and uh, they thought it was cancerous. It was biopsied, and the results came back. It is benign. And so we're very grateful for that news. Uh, also, Linda Brobst, we shared a prayer request last week about her. They found lesions on her hip bone. They thought it was potentially bone cancer. Uh, did a biopsy. The results are she does not have cancer. She has arthritis. Okay, so the lesions were an indication of arthritis. Uh, so the good news is there's no cancer. The bad news is it's arthritis, all right? 
Um, I don't remember what older gentleman told me this, and he was probably all of 50 when he told me, but I was 10, so he was really old. Um, <laughs> now he was probably just a young guy to me, all right? But I remember him saying when he had arthritis, he said, but I've been told Arthur is the meanest of all the rightest brothers. So anyway, that's what she has. Um, Ricky Cox uh, spent an evening in the hospital this past week. She's going through a few things, but she's doing better, and we're grateful for that. Uh, my nephew, Andrew, was in the hospital for two nights, three days. Uh, we're waiting for a biopsy result on his esophagus. They first thought it was gallbladder. It was not. They thought it was ulcers. It was not. Uh, but there was a spot on his esophagus, and so we're waiting the results of that. We'll hear about that next week. Um, we had services this past week for Rick Watt, part of our church, Rudy Alarcon, who was not, but remember those families. And then this afternoon, I really do uh, desire your prayers. Uh, we have a service here, all right, at 3 o'clock this afternoon for Hunter Lamar. Uh, Hunter was 17 years old. He just graduated from Bullard High School in June. He was diagnosed uh, the 1st of July with leukemia. And he died just two weeks ago tomorrow uh, at Children's Hospital. So this is a... Um, this is a great nephew to my Uncle Al, who was out visiting from Oklahoma. This is his brother's grandson. Uh, and so these are always very challenging. And that will be this afternoon at 3. So our staff and volunteers at the end of the next service will be clearing the stage and straightening the sanctuary, preparing overflow in the other building just in case. And so please be in prayer for that service that we can offer some words of, of help and hope and comfort to the family and all of his young friends who will be with, us, um, uh, be with us this afternoon. Today would have been his 18th birthday today. So just be in prayer for them. So those are the updates. The last thing I have to send around is a sign-up sheet. This is for, yes? Yes, thank you, Mark Gerlach. Um, yeah, you put the two families together, the Gallant and the Gerlach family there, all right? So yes, thank you for reminding me of that. Mark Gerlach. Uh, was at our church during his college days and his early marriage years. He married a, a young lady out of our college group, Jennifer, whose mother is also part of our church, uh, Carolyn Cope. Uh, Mark Gerlach was discovered with uh, tumors in his lung. Uh, right lung was pretty well filled with tumors. Uh, left lung, it's showing a spot. Don't know the results of all of it yet. It could be, very possibly is, a stage 4 lung cancer. He's never smoked a day in his life. He's 44 years old. Um, and so we're waiting for results. I had a chance to visit with him this past week on the phone. Um, his faith in Christ is rock solid. He said, I know where I'm going. Uh, we'll trust the Lord for what the next steps are. And my biggest prayer is for his wife uh, as they go through this. Um, um, her dad, who was part of our church family here, he died at 45 of lung cancer. And uh, so I know there's a replay going on, all right, in her life right now. So um, if you would just be remembering uh, the Gerlach and the Cope families, I know they would appreciate that so very, very much. Chick, thank you for reminding me of that. Um, Sign-up sheet's going around for Nan Isom's Tuesday evening Bible study that will kick off September the 12th at 645. It's going to be on the Sermon on the Mount. And so if you would like to be a part of that study, put your name and contact information so they have enough materials there. At this time, I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward, wait on us as we have our morning tithes and offering. Would you join with me, please, as we pray? Our Father... This has been a week that has been filled with lots of challenges. And in the midst of all of those challenges, there have been some bright spots. The news we got about Sherry and the news we got about Linda were bright spots. Father, in the midst of all that is lung cancer discovered in a 40-year-old. In the midst of all that, the preparations for a service to honor a 17-year-old. In the midst of all of that, Father, there are um, tests that are being done and people in a waiting room to hear what the results of those tests are going to be. And so, Father, this is, uh, on weeks like this, it's a, it's a stretching of our faith. It's a testing of our faith. It's a building of our faith. Or, Father, on some occasions, if we become so consumed with the circumstances that we forget to focus our attention on a God who is above the circumstances, sometimes weeks like this can be the destroying of our faith. 
Because we begin to put our faith in what we can see rather than the one who transcends what we see. We look at the now instead of the long run. We look at the present instead of eternity. And so, Father, I pray that, um, that Father, you will, you will do for us as you did for one gentleman in the Scripture who said, Lord, I believe, now help my unbelief. We want these seasons of challenge and difficulty to be faith-building seasons in our lives. Father, I hope that you will use us to be of hope and encouragement to others whose faith may just about be shattered. Or, Father, you will use us to encourage those who maybe have never had faith before. And whatever this, this tough season is they're going through right now, they will come to a discovery that they don't want to face any more of these valleys of trouble without faith because they've seen the difference that faith makes in the lives of others. Father, we trust you for what it is that you want to say and do in our midst today. I pray that we will have open hearts and open ears and very, very submissive wills to follow your leadership. Lord, for the Gerlach and Cope family, we particularly lift them up to you today. And though they are a long-range distance from us, um, they're never, ever, ever away from you. Thank you for the difference that faith is making in them at this particular moment. And um, again, if you give us a nudge to call, to send a card, to send an email, to pray, I trust you'll find us ready and responsive. For the Lamar family today, Lord, I know this was a challenging morning. It was a morning that four or five months ago they expected to wake up and to have a birthday party for their 18-year-old son. And yet today they're going to have a memorial celebration. And so we pray. We pray that you will use any of your family to be of encouragement to their family today. For the privilege of giving and sharing today, we say thank you. And we do so with joy-filled hearts. We commit all this to you and so much more in the incredible name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You had a new face on the stage as a new part of our worship team today. Introduce her. Marguerite McCaffrey, uh, for those of you who uh, know Marion and Joan Den Hartog, uh, this is their favorite daughter. Also happens to be their only daughter, all right, but uh, certainly their favorite. Uh, we have about 25, maybe 28, uh, mostly men, but I think maybe a couple of women from our congregation who are up in the Stanford area today with Angel Tree Football Camp. They are with Joe Avila from Prison Fellowship. Uh, every Christmas time, we participate with a ministry called Angel Tree. Uh, it is where we as members of God's family buy presents for children who have an incarcerated mother or father or on some occasions both parents are incarcerated. And we provide gifts to their children in the love of Christ and in the name of their incarcerated parent, trying to make a positive difference at a very difficult time for children. Uh, uh, an outreach that has been birthed from Angel Tree Christmas time. Uh, has now been what's called Angel Tree Football Camp. Uh, it used to meet at Stanford University for the last couple of years. It is meeting at what once was the training ground, the practice facility for the 49ers football team. They've outgrown that, and so it's now a municipal park area, but we're able to reserve it. There's a lot of history there as well as wonderful facilities. Uh, former football players, most of them 49ers, but not all of them, a few Oakland Raiders, uh, a few from other, uh, other national teams, but they are now retired who also have faith in Jesus. They come and they put on this camp. Our staff goes up and uh, they set up, they clean up, uh, and they do whatever former football players tell them to do, all right, uh, as volunteers at the camp. These, uh, these young kids, both boys and girls, get a chance to learn some athletic things they wouldn't learn anywhere else. And they also get to hear from the lips of professional athletes the difference that Jesus Christ can make in their life. And so this is a big day. Uh, and so 
as you pray throughout the morning, be praying for uh, the team that is up there and the difference that they are making and connecting to uh, young lives. The uh, bulletin today talks about Haggai, all right, on the front page. That is an announcement for where we're going to be next Sunday. I actually said I might start it today, uh, but I'm not. And there's a couple of reasons to why I'm not. Uh, number one is there was this nagging kind of thought in my back of my head. I wasn't quite finished with Habakkuk yet, even though I did a whole big summary thing last Sunday, all right? But there was something that bad, and I was preparing for Haggai. Uh, and then I got an email from my wife. How many of you get emails from your spouse? It does, okay, all right, yeah. Well, what I found out is sometimes, you know, you can say things at a greater degree, you know, in written form than you always can, you know, in the verbal skills. And uh, well, what she was really telling is she wasn't telling me what I needed to preach on today, but what she was telling me is what one of the sermons was an aha moment for her. Now, I, I preached Habakkuk this year because she had actually been asking me for four or five years. She said, one of my most memorable favorite series that you've ever preached at New Hope was on Habakkuk, and that was 20-some years ago. Uh, we weren't married then. And uh, she said, I would love for you to do it again, kind of like the song we sang, do it again. And uh, so after a couple of years, I did it again, all right? Um, and, and, and her aha moment in the sermon series this time was... Um, not something I dwelt on very long. It was more a passing comment in the last two sermons. Uh, but it meant something to her. And it was the reference to yet faith that Habakkuk demonstrated. How many of you remember me saying something over the last six weeks about yet faith? Good. Ten of you. Um, which I must say is much better than the 8 o'clock crowd. Uh, they, nobody raised their hands. So, so um, anyway, as, as, as she talked about that, uh, it sort of brought a sense of peace to my heart that that's really probably how I needed to wrap things up and to do that this Sunday. And so we're going to be looking at yet faith. So turn to the book of Habakkuk. I'm not going to spend much time in review of this, but I'm going to look at the wrap-up verses, verses 16 uh, through the end of the chapter, which is 19. All right? Uh, this is, uh, as you remember, Habakkuk's a running conversation that Habakkuk is having with God. It's a prayer. One talks, the other listens. The other one talks, the other one listens. And it's back and forth. That's what prayer is. After God had, through conversation with Habakkuk, really changed his attitude from chapter 1, where it stinks, Habakkuk is in a bad place, he's in a bad mood, he has a bad attitude. Time we get to chapter 3 in this conversation, there has been a 180 degree turn. That often ought to be the case in our conversations with God. There ought to be a change of attitude and a change of mood. And um, he gets to the wrap up here and after Habakkuk has seen God's presence and been reminded of again and again, I love it. That's a great song to play at this moment. Um, maybe this is a good time for me to tell you to turn your phones to silence. No, I'm... God calling. Always answer God when he calls. It's for me. <laughs> Tim, go back to the original sermon. Um, Habakkuk says, I heard. He said, I heard God. And my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. When we hear God speak, we have one of two choices in our life. Fear or faith. He said, decay crept into, decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. I, fear jumped in. I, I can continue down the road of fear or I can go to the opposite direction, which is faith. Yet, this is yet faith. Here it is. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Do you hear what he just said? And I didn't dwell on this at all. Chapter 1, God tells Habakkuk, hey, you guys have been rebelling and disobeying me for so long, I'm going to send your dreaded enemy, the Babylonians, to come and take you into captivity. That's God's discipline. But that's patient discipline. He had tried for years to get them to pay attention, and they'd ignored him. And, and Habakkuk was angry at God for that. Now in chapter 3, 
He said, I will wait patiently. Yet, yet faith took impatience and made it patient. Took anger and brought it to a point of contentment. And he said, I will wait patiently. Though the fig tree does not bud and though there are no grapes on the vines and the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, life is as bad as it can get in my world. Yet, there it is again, circle that word yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength and he makes my feet like the feet of a deer and enables me to go on the high places. Yet faith. So we talk about yet faith, what does that mean? Sally gave me a great acrostic for the word yet, so I want to share it with you right now. All right? Y of yet means yield to God. That's what faith is all about. It's our yielding to God's plan and purpose in our life. The letter E in the word yet, let's embrace his plans for us even when we don't like them. Have you ever had some plans in your life that you didn't like, that that you knew they were from God? (laughs) And the T is trust the outcome before it happens. That's faith. In this case, Babylonian captivity. The promise eventually would be fulfilled again, that God's people would be in God's promised land, but for a period of time, they were not going to be there. They were going to be in captivity. Yet, I will trust the outcome before it happens. We've got a few folks in our congregation who've spent some time uh, at state or federal expense. They spent time incarcerated. For those of you who didn't know, our, our, our worship leader, Tim Kepler, spent a little time in, in Folsom. I almost said Fullerton. (laughs) I mean, you've been close to Fullerton, you know. Yeah, but spent some time in Folsom, all right? Um, And and you know what? I think almost every one of them, and I could look out and point others out, um, and they wouldn't mind, but every one of them would probably say today, that was God's best for them at that time in their life because it brought them to a place they would have never, ever been. You can trust the outcome before it happens. And this is now the outcome. They're they're worship leaders and volunteers and and engaged in ministry and God's kingdom work. So we're going to spend a few minutes today talking about yet faith. Most of you are familiar with Larry Keene, right? Even you younger ones, you've heard the name Larry Keene. All right, yeah, he's he's, he's old now, really old, but he's still around. Um, He was on TV. He tells a story about three farmers who gathered daily in a field during a horrible drought to pray for rain. They were on their knees, looking upward, hoping the skies would would bring much-needed rain. Unfortunately, the heavens stayed silent and quiet, and the, the, the petitioners became discouraged. But they continued to meet every single morning, very early, on their knees, out in a field. One morning, an uninvited stranger approaches the three farmers and asks them, What are you doing? And they all responded, We're praying for rain. And the newcomer looks at each of them and shakes his head and says, nah, I don't think you are. And the first farmer says, well, of course we're praying. We're on our knees. We're pleading. Look, there's a drought. We haven't had rain in over a year. The outsider continues to nod his head, and he advises them that what they're doing is never going to work. The second farmer jumps in, and he says, we need rain. We're not asking for ourselves, but, but for our families and for our livestock and for our neighbors. The man listens and says, still unimpressed, Uh, You guys are wasting your time. The third farmer can't take it anymore, and in anger he said, Okay, smart aleck, what would you do if you were in our shoes? And the visitor says, Do you really want to know? And the three landowners all answer, Yeah, we really want to know. The future of our farms and our families is at stake. And the guest announces, I would have brought an umbrella. I would have brought, how often do we pray with no anticipation that he is going to bring us an answer? And I don't mean necessarily the answer we're looking for, but bring us an answer. Faith is trusting the outcome before it happens. What, one more illustration of this fact and faith principle. There was a pastor who was preaching to his people on the relationship between fact and faith. And he illustrated it this way. He said, you are sitting in front of me in this church. That is a fact. I am standing here speaking to you from this pulpit. That is a fact. That I believe that anyone is listening to me, that is faith. (laughs) 
this passage out of Habakkuk from the Minor Prophet uh, was written in the 6th century B.C., just prior to them being captured by the Babylonians. If we listen carefully at the words of Habakkuk, we see throughout this chapter that he's facing all kinds of tension. He, he, he's frustrated with how unrighteous the community is in which he lives. C could you and I say we kind of have that same tension going on in our world today? Habakkuk also said that, that, that he's got this tension of, of Israel's internal sins, that even his own people are, are ignoring God. Think of the irony of it. A nation that never knew God, the Babylonians, were going to be used to judge a nation that chose to forget God. Isn't that sad? And that was a tension in Habakkuk's life. And I thought this week, wow, could that be America? Could we be on the brink of possibly that very same tension? And the third tension point is, is the internal struggle of Habakkuk. He, he's trying to come to grips with his own theology. Life is not what he expected it to be when he was chosen to be a prophet of God. The things falling apart was not in his plan. And he's starting to wonder what he believed about God and what he believed about God's actions or inactions in his world. So Habakkuk needed a Thursday morning men's Bible study on apologetics. And we see, we saw in this call and response, this give and take, this ebb and flow throughout these three chapters of this little book, a journey of Habakkuk's spiritual formation and transformation. It's in this context that yet faith really jumps out at us. Habakkuk, Habakkuk, proclaims in these last few verses that when life gets as bad as it can get, when the economy collapses and the agribusiness is out of business and everything that you want to go right goes wrong, what's his response? Yet I will wait patiently. Yet I will rejoice. Yet faith. You know what's astounding to me? is that there were so many young men at this time who loved God in the nation of Israel. I mean, there was a bucket load of folks who weren't. But it was a young generation. Habakkuk was not all that old when he wrote this. Following Habakkuk are going to be some other... If you go to the book of Daniel, in fact, turn to Daniel because we're going to look at a couple things quickly. Daniel's written after Habakkuk. The Babylonians have come and taken the children of Israel into captivity. Nebuchadnezzar is ruling the world at that time. Nebuchadnezzar was a smart king. He saw there was a lot of smart Jewish young men. They were smart. And he didn't want to just, he, he wasn't just going to use them as slaves. He was going to, to use the best for his best. And so he sent these young men to their schools to learn their ways, their traditions, and, and then he was going to use their brilliant minds for, for help in his own nation. He was smart. And so I, I alluded to this three or four sermons ago. I just quickly made a reference to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now those of us who grew up in church, we know those three guys, right? Right? I mean, we, we, we heard those stories. We even had songs in Sunday school about those three guys, all right? But you know what I found out? I had somebody, I had about three people come to me after that passing comment about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and uh, they said, Tim, who are those guys? And so I realized something. I can't just make casual references. Sometimes we've got to spend a little time and go back and find out about them, so I want to do that. Um, um, uh, Pastor E.V. Hill. Do you remember him from Southern California? Pastor E.V. Hill, Hill uh, pastor of a large, large church in Southern California, and he's a large, was a large, I don't know, uh, uh, black guy, all right? Could preach. But, oh, could E.V. Hill preach, man. Um, he preached a friend of ours' funeral in Southern California who was the head of uh, World Vision at the time. Um, but E.V. Hill had a sermon, and, and, and the title of his sermon was Shadrach, Meshach, and a Bad Negro. <laughs> 
That, that, was, that was a sermon. It was, it, boy, did he light it up? Did he light it up, man? Um, but, but, but this is a story, and, and it's chapter 3, and I'm going I'm to take the time to read it, all right? Because uh, it, it kind of explains itself. So chapter 3, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold. How big was this image? It was 90 feet high, and it was 9 feet wide. And he set it up on the plain of Dur in the province of Babylon. And then he summoned the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all other politicians to come to the dedication of the image that he had set up. So all those politicians, because I'm not going to say all those names again, they all showed up for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, This is what you, command, you are commanded to do, O peoples, nations, and men of every language. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, and all kinds of music, you must fall down on your face and worship the image of gold King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of all those, uh, all those uh, instruments, the people of every language fell down and worshiped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Talk about kiss butts. Politicians right here, man. You have issued a decree, O king, that everyone who hears all those instruments and worship the image of gold, and whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into the blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the... Okay, here's the problem. It's not the Jews they're upset with. It's the Jewish young men who have been set over them in the province. You get this? They're over the affairs. They're over us. They're got their name, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They pay no attention to you. O king, they neither, they neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is this true, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of all these instruments, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I've made, very good. But if you do not worship it, it'll be, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then listen to this. There's a little doubt. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? I, I, I sense a tinge of doubt in Nebuchadnezzar with that question. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. <laughs> We're not going to debate you over this, king. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able. Did we not sing about that today? God is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O God. All right, now ver verse 18. But, or we could say yet, because I think yet faith sounds better than but faith. All right? I'm just saying. I, I, think, I think it does. Okay? I'm already in trouble today. All right? But even yet, even if he does not save us from this furnace, we want you to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. You see, they were willing to trust whatever the outcome was in advance. If we get rescued, great. If we get singed, great. If we die, not a problem. We're not changing where our faith is. That's yet faith. The Nebuchadnezzar was furious. And his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, throw them in the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blaze. They didn't get thrown in. <laughs> they fell in. Because the guys who were to do the throwing died. Okay? So they fell in the furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement. And he asked his advisors, wasn't it three men that we tied up and threw in the fire? They replied, certainly, O king. He said, look, I see four. He's amazed. There's four in there. And he's also amazed they're not tied up anymore. They're walking in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like the Son of God. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening. I don't think he got as close as the guards did. All right? 
he approached the opening and looked in and he said, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God. Has his attitude changed? <laughs> Come on out of there, you guys. Come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire and all those politicians crowded around. And they saw the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, talk about a change of heart. Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and are willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who sow anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble for no other God can save in this way. Wow. Talk about yet faith. You have yet faith? You see, in this passage, we saw the challenge to the three Hebrew children's faith. We saw the consequences. You might be bound and thrown in fire. The conclusion of the results, verses 19 through 30, is people are amazed when they see yet faith. We sang a song, our last song, Do It Again. A line in that song that just jumped out, This is my confidence. You have never failed me yet. Daniel, um, just, just a couple of chapters over, all right? Um, chapter 6. It's a story of another Jewish young man at the same time of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Just on the heels of that, still in Babylonian captivity. All right, a little after Haggai. We see the story of Daniel and the lion. How many of you know the story of Daniel and the lion's den? How many of you have never read the story? It's okay to raise your hand. How many of you have never read the story of Daniel and the lion's den? Okay, how many of you don't want to raise your hand at all? Just raise your hand. Okay, all right, all right, very good. But, but what, what a classic story it is. And I'm going to read it to you because it's another example of yet faith. So, so Dan, nah, yeah, I'm going to read a few verses. It pleased Darius. Darius is now uh, king instead of Nebuchadnezzar to appoint 120 politicians to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. Daniel got a high government appointment, and he's not a Babylonian. He's a Jew, all right? Uh, all those other politicians were made accountable to these guys so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among all these politicians by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Uh-oh, vice president, all right, going to be in charge of everything. At this, all those other politicians tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel and his conduct of governmental affairs. Wow, what's going on in government now is not new. It's been around a long time. That's true whether you're Republican or Democrat. Babylonian or Jew, all right? And now look at this next line. How often can this be said about anybody in government? They found no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will find any basis for charge. We'll make them up. We'll make them up. Daniel, against Daniel, unless he has something to do with the law, we, we, we can't find anything unless it's connected to his faith. And, and, and so over the next several verses, what we find out is these guys use religion to try to defeat the godly. We're going to make some rules about religion, very similar to what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had to face. Darius made a, you know, he was going to be their god rather than God. The king was going to be God. But Daniel wouldn't kneel. So in the rest of the chapter, they throw Daniel in the lion's den because that was going to be the consequence of not bowing to Darius as God. But Darius loved Daniel. We find this at the first light of dawn, verse 19. It's kind of like resurrection morning. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. Kind of like the women got up and hurried to the tomb. The difference is, is those women didn't go to the tomb expecting a risen Savior. They expected a dead friend. Darius shows up with a bit of expectation of a living Daniel. He gets up, he hurries there, and when he came near, he calls to Daniel. <laughs> Daniel, are you there? Is the servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve been able to rescue you from the lions? And Daniel said, yep. 
<laughs> That's if he was from Clovis, he would have said, yep. <laughs> Daniel said, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I done any wrong before you, O king. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was listed from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. Daniel slept with the kitties that night. Awesome. That's yet faith, folks. There was a test of Daniel's faith in this chapter. There is the testimony of Daniel's faith to the king. There is the triumph of Daniel's faith on resurrection morning. And then there is the truth of Daniel's faith that God honors yet faith. You see, in yet faith, we say we're willing to ride or die with God. It means that no matter what people think, do, or say, we are sticking with God. It is this faith, yet faith, that sustained Habakkuk and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and Daniel and so many more when they faced crisis or calamity, hopelessness or helplessness, chaos or confusion, despair or destruction. Do you have yet faith? Maybe a more important question is, do you have any faith? The Bible says we don't need a lot of faith to become a believer in Jesus Christ. Faith the size of a grain of mustard seed. But once the mustard seed has been planted, do you know how big the mustard plant gets? It's really big. So our faith can start small, but it can end up as yet faith. I wish I had the time to take you to Genesis 22 and would kind of dissect Abraham and Isaac going up the mountain, all right? Maybe that'll be another one. But let me close with this. Am I willing to trust the hand of God whose face I cannot see? Am I willing to trust a God who sometimes does things that I don't like and gives me direction in ways I don't want to go? Am I willing to trust a God who wants to change my attitude about life, about death, about eternity, about forgiveness? Here's the deal. Ask your questions of God. Ask your doubt questions of Him. Ask your frustrating questions of Him. And see if when you ask and then listen, your faith doesn't grow into yet faith. What is yet faith? One more time. It starts with yielding to God. It continues when we embrace His plan for us. And it ends, it comes to maturity when we trust the outcome before it happens. Yet, faith. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the examples of Scripture. These are not fairy tales. These are real historical moments in time. This is real life living. You show us scriptures that contain the good, the bad, and the ugly. This is not tarnished truth. This is not, um, this is not a rewrite of truth. You show the failure along with the success. You show the frustrations along with the faithfulness. You show us how we can grow through the seasons of trouble and the valleys of shadow of death. You reveal to us that what's true about guys like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what's true about, about women like Esther and Ruth. You, you show us the fact that, that all of us, all of us can grow into men and women who have yet faith. I pray, Father, you will have great freedom in the lives of those of us who are here this morning to begin the next step of development of yet faith in our lives. It starts when we yield to you. It continues when we embrace your plans and we experience the reality of that kind of faith when we trust in the outcome even before it happens. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.
Go have a great afternoon. Pray for our service here this afternoon.